Can you see those slides? All good. All right, so this afternoon, for the next 40 minutes to an hour, I'm just going to talk to you about snake bites and give you an approach to actually diagnosing someone that has a potential snake bite um, and how we actually manage someone presenting to the emergency department or your nursing post that's been bitten by a snake bite. So the learning points are going to be, we're going to look at some of the epidemiology around snake bites in Australia. I'm going to give you a bit of a structured approach to what we should be assessing for from triage through to when we get these patients into your resuscitation bay. We're going to talk a bit about antivenoms and when we're going to give them, and then we're going to go over some common cases. I can't see any of the comments um, but I'll get to them at the end and I'll answer all your questions then, if you don't mind, we'll just go through the talk. So snake bites in Australia, they are quite common and we've done a big project over about the last, since 2005, which is the Australian snake bite project and it was very prevalent from 2005 to 2015. And it's still ongoing now. And we know from that big study that we see about 3,000 bites per year presenting to emergency departments or to nursing posts seeking treatment. But of those 3,000 bites, about 200 of them are actually envenomed and require antivenom. So there's a lot of dry bites, or there's a lot of people that have potentially think they've been bitten by a snake, but it hasn't eventuated or hasn't eventuated into envenomation. We do know that there's about one to two deaths per year from snake bites in Australia. So these are the ones that we really need to have prompt recognition and aggressive early management to try and prevent some of these deaths from occurring. There's about a group of six snakes in Australia. So you have your common, your brown snakes, tiger snakes, your black snakes, uh, your death adders and your sea snakes and that. And we know that from studying and doing this big study over the years that each snake has this characteristic clinical syndrome. And this can actually help us out by working out what type of snake might have bought, bitten the individual. So we can look at that as we go through this talk. We are heading into snake bike season at the moment. And with this is certainly data from this ASP project that we know that, as you can see here on this graph, the bites start to pick up when snakes come out of hibernation. They like the warm weather. And so we know through from about October and we get our peak snake bites between December and January, and then it tapers off as we heard head into autumn and into the winter months. And we can see there that it correlates with the amount of envenomation as well. So peak envenomation and peak number of bites is January in December with in January and December and February being um, quite high as well. So it is the summer months and we are heading into this season now. So we need to be mindful and aware that these patients will start presenting. And certainly in the Metro ED, I know at Charlie's we've had a couple in the last couple of weeks. And I know through talking to the Tox guys, they've had a few out in the country as well of recently. So we need to be aware and mindful that these patients will start presenting. So what causes people to actually get uh, bitten by a snake? And so this is data. It's a bit of old data, but it's the best I can find from 1980 to 2007. The most common cause reason that people get bitten by a snake is they tread on it accidentally. So they tread on the snake, not realising it, especially out in the bush, walking out at night, walking through long grass and that. People often get bitten where they try to kill or capture the snake or they misidentify it as, say, a lizard or something like that and they pick it up that way. And that's when they get bitten. Herpetologists are people that actually collect and work with snakes and these are a high risk, dangerous occupation because they're at risk of getting bitten just through the nature of their job. So when we look at snakes on lethality, and so this is based on the venom scale and the lethal dose, in Australia, we are home to the 10 most venomous snakes in the world. And certainly the most toxic one that has such a huge venom scale is the inland taipan. Uh, we don't see these in Western Australia, so we're quite lucky these mainly inhabit southwestern Queensland and regional areas of central Australia and these have such a high venom scale um, lethal dose that they'll quite often result in death 
What we do see in the WA quite a lot is the eastern brown snake bites and tiger snake bites. And there on a venom scale is about half of the inland taipan, but these result in the most number of deaths that we see by generally than how many in the population they are and how what area they actually inhibit. Other things to be aware of is there's different types of brown snakes, and we'll talk about that when we look at a case study and the death adder as well, we'll go through as well. But the inland taipan is certainly the one we worry about, um, but we're lucky it's not inhabited over in Western Australia. As we move through this talk, there's a few terms I just thought we'd go over that are very specific to snake bites and snake envenomation. And so lymphadenopathy is where you get painful and large lymph nodes that are affected in the bite. So the venom, when you get bitten by a snake um, and it goes through your soft tissues, the venom goes into your lymphatic system. We'll talk about this more with the pressure mobilization bandage, but that's how it gets into your circulatory system is through going through this lymphatic system. So we need to know and assess for when we got raised and enlarged lymph nodes, um, because this is a sign that they're possible envenomation. VIC is another term we'll talk about, and this is venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy. So this is a nasty form of coagulopathy that occurs from certain types of snakes, and this is where you get an unrecordable INR, fibrinogens undetectable, and these patients will bleed from this, and this is when we can result in things like catastrophic intracerebral hemorrhages and stuff from this venom-induced coagulopathy, and we'll go through that a bit more. Anticoagulant coagulopathy, we see mainly with black snakes and that, and that's where you get a mild rise in your APTC. Systemic symptoms, I'm going to go through a bit more because we used to refer to these as non-specific symptoms, but we actually think from this AS study that the systemic symptoms could actually be, um, we used to talk about them as non-specific, but they're actually quite specific to envenomation, we need to take these things a bit more seriously. Bite size features, we look at fang marks, bruising, local necrosis that can occur over the bite size. Neurological features that we see with certain um, snakes, so ptosis, where you get drooping of your upper eyelids, double vision, which is diplopia, blurred vision. Um, you can get bulbar muscle weakness, so difficulty swelling and respiratory paralysis that can occur with tiger snakes. Myotoxicity is where you get breakdown and muscle tenders that can lead to rhabdomyolysis. And then there's some snakes that can cause this TMA, which is a thrombotic microangiography, which where you get thrombocytopenia, renal impairment, and it's all to do with fragmentation of the red blood cells from the actual venom. So when we talk about snake bites and snake bites presenting to the ED, we can have definitive or suspected snake bites. So we know people, they try to handle a snake and they feel a bit, they've got two fang marks or puncture marks into the skin. That's a definitive. We also get people that present that say they're walking along, they saw a snake and they thought it might be um, have bitten them, but you can't actually find any signs of puncture marks to the skin. And that either way, we take both of these just as seriously and they get the same amount of care. Um, and attention. And so these are time critical presentations, snake bites. So they need to be an ATS category of two. Okay. And they need to go through to a resuscitation bay. Regardless of whether you think it's definitive or suspected, you need to actually take every case seriously because there has been um, cases where they've suspected, oh, it's just a stick bite. They're just a bit um, anxious because they saw a snake. If they present and they're worried, we need to take it seriously and you go down the same pathway regardless, okay? So we've got to avoid getting into that cognitive bias type trap with that. And in the emergency department, we require a really simple and standardised approach. They need to be in an area where there's clinical experience. And if you don't have that clinical experience, because there's not a lot of experts in snake bites, and it's mainly a handful of clinical toxicologists around Australia that are really actual clinical experts, but we can get you access to them through using the Poisons Information Centre on 13, 11, 26. 
We want to make sure that these patients are in a hospital that have a Pathways laboratory that's available 24-7 because we need to do coagulation profiles and other bloods and we can't do these on point of care testing. So we do transfer a lot of these patients around the states to regional resource centres and down into metro areas to allow for this to occur. And you also want to be in a place that has adequate antivenom stocks. And they've certainly in the WAC sites, you will have for the snakes that are geographically located around your area, you should have adequate antivenom stocks to meet all those needs of these patients presenting to you. So the resuscitation phase. So when you get these patients into your resuscitation bay, and we're going to start off assessing their airway, breathing, circulation, there's a few snake bites and it's around 5%. Or so that can present with quite systemic features that need early and aggressive resuscitation care. And that can present from cardiac arrest to sudden collapse and hypertension from the direct um, myocardial effects of the envenomation. We also know that certain snakes can cause respiratory failure because it targets the pre and post synaptic neurons. And that results in paralysis, that results in renal failure. Seizures can occur. And when we got that severe venom induced consumptive coagulopathy, this is that can also result in uncontrollable hemorrhage. And we'll go through that a bit more. So your history that you're going to take from these patients, whether you're at triage or whether you've initially got them into your resus bay, there's things that you're going to want to know because when you discuss with the clinical toxicologist, these are the questions that they're going to ask you. So they want to know the geographical area of the bite. So where are you located and what's around you? Because then they know what snakes inhabit that area and that can help them with their decision making and to know what signs to look for. Appearance of snakes, we tend not to anchor too much on this because it can be um, false leading. But as we'll go through, so you have red belly black snakes, which we don't see a lot in Western Australia but they have a characteristic red marking on their belly. So that's one way of identifying them. Um, death adders, they are this short fat snake with this diamond head, which is, I'll show you some pictures as we look at a case study of them. And that can actually help guide our treatment, but we shouldn't anchor on that too much. When you start talking about browns and tigers, they can sometimes look the same. And certainly once you get bitten or an encounter with a snake, there's generally some form of panic and dysregulation in a bit. So you may not actually be as clear with your description from the patient. So we shouldn't anchor on that too much. You wanna know the anatomical side of bite. We know that the most common around legs, ankles, feet, because snakes get trodden on. If they're being handled, then they can be bitten anywhere on the body from the face to the arms, um, to the torso and that. Number of strikes. So has a snake bitten more than once? Um, because that then increases the risk of envenomation. The use of pressure and bandage immobilization, and we'll go through that, but pressure mobilization bandage, if it hasn't been put on pre hospitally you need to get it on at triage, and you need to have these bandages stocked at your triage bay in your cupboard there, ready to put on as soon as these patients present. You want to know about any early signs of symptoms from the, that might be occurring. So have they had a collapse? Have they got nausea, vomiting, bleeding? weakness, those sort of things. And if they've come in by ambulance or with mine site workers and that, what's the pre-hospital course been like? Have they had episodes of hypertension? Have they got an IV in, but you notice that there's bleeding from around the cannula sites? That's a sign of VIC developing. Um, are they making urine? What colour is their urine? Those sorts of things. Your physical examination is going to be full set of vital signs. You're going to assess their mental state as well. You want to look for evidence of a bite, but also remembering that lack of evidence does not exclude envenoming. Okay, so if you can't find a bite site, but they've come into contact with a snake, you need to take it seriously. Assessing for lymphadenopathy, you want to then also look for evidence of abnormal bleeding. So over the bite site, have they got a slow ooze? Are they bleeding around their gums? Have they got epistaxis? Have they got um, hematuria and stuff developing, which is a sign that they've got fragmented red blood cells from the envenomation. 
You're going to then do a neurological assessment, and this assesses for the neurotoxicity sides of things. So you want to look for descending symmetrical flaccid paralysis. So this is where we can be looking at the eyes. So are they having trouble keeping their eyes open? So that's a sign, or their eyelids open. Um, the small muscles of their face, their bulbar function, and assessing their respiratory function. So we can do things like continuous SATs monitoring, peak expiratory flow, and that can help you monitor it over the course to see if they're improving, stabilizing, or getting worse. These systemic symptoms that we need to be aware of, we used to talk about this as being non-specific symptoms, but we actually think from this AS project that we did and looked at it, that these are actually kind of systemic symptoms and we need to weigh all these up in the overall clinical picture. So if they're reporting things like headache, diaphoresis, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain and diarrhea, these are all pretty good signs that they could have envenomation and we need to start taking them a bit more seriously than what we have done in the past. The good thing when we're looking at snake bites and snake bites in Western Australia and stuff is we can break the examination of our systems down into three main groups. So you've got your neurotoxic effects, like I've talked about, so ptosis, drooping of the eyelids, so they're struggling to keep their eyelids open. A thelmoplegia is weakness of your actual eye muscles or your eyeball muscles. Diplopia, so double vision. Dysarthria, so difficult with communicating and articulating their words and swallowing. Assessing for limb weakness, remember they're going to get a descending type paralysis, so it'll start getting weak from the top and working its way down. And then the respiratory muscle weakness, so keeping an eye on their saturations, their respiratory effort, peak expiratory flow, stuff like that. Moving on then, we need to look at their coagulation status. So we look at this via bloods, but clinically and at the end of the bed, looking for your bleeding gums, prolonged bleeding from bites, IV sites, the epistaxis and hematuria. And then moving on to your muscle type damage. So they may have muscle tenderness. Um, certainly with your black snakes and that, they'll get quite severe and sore muscles. They'll get pain on movement, um, some weakness, and they can develop rhabdomyo lysis and myoglobinuria from developing as well. We know that the snake envenomation uh, sits in the lymphatic system and that's how it's transmitted to the circulatory system. So I just sort of bring you back to a bit of patho. So assessing your lymphatic system. So generally, if they've been bitten on the limbs, then we're going to assess for your pelvic lymph nodes, have a feel in their groin. You also have lumbar lymph nodes, inguinal lymph nodes. Um, so you want to actually be feeling and palpating for these uh, proximal to the bite site to see if they are actually tender and enlarged. That can be um, a sign of envenomation as well. Moving on to your clinical effects of your snake bite. So this is where we break it down into this group of six or seven types of snakes and what their actual clinical and laboratory findings that we're going to look for on the snakes. So brown snakes, which are very common, these with sign when they are envenomed, the coagulopathic profile will be that they'll have that venom induced consumptive coagulopathy. They won't have any signs of neurotoxicity with brown snakes. Myotoxicity is quite rare. But other clinical features that can occur is collapse and cardiac arrest early in these patients. So if you've got a patient presents that's been out walking in the bush and query may have come in contact with the snake and they go into cardiac arrest, this is an indication where you're going to actually give them brown snake antivenom as part of your cardiac arrest. They can also develop that thrombotic microangiography, which leads to um, renal failure as well. Black snakes, which is also referred to as your mulga type snakes, they get that anticoagulopathy, so they'll get a rise in their APTT. Um, they do get some muscle breakdown with myotoxicity, so they often report local bite site pain, and they can sometimes go into renal failure for it, requiring dialysis. Tiger snakes, they're very similar to brown, that they result in the venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy. They will develop neurotoxicity. It's generally a slow onset over hours. They can develop myotoxicity as well. Um, and they can get that thrombotic microangiography and lead to renal failure as well. Death adder doesn't result in any coagulopathy or myotoxicity, 
but they will they can get slow onset um, neurotoxicity that results in descending paralysis. Uh, sea snakes don't result in a coagulopathy, but they do get a rapid onset of neurotoxicity and it can develop some myotoxicity as well and lead to renal failure. And then taipans, which we don't see a lot of in Western Australia, they when they're envenomed, you'll see that they have the VIC, they get rapid onset of neurotoxicity and they get myotoxicity as well. So they're quite difficult to manage and treat. So the diagnostic process that you're going to take when one of these patients come into you is that you want to establish the presence of envenomation on arrival. So if the patient has no clinical or laboratory evidence of envenomation on arrival, we can actually observe these patients for 12 hours with appropriate repeat laboratory testing um, and doing serial neurological examinations and stuff. If the patient does present with signs of envenoming, then we need to determine which snake or which groups of snakes is most likely to be involved. And then from working out which group of snakes or which snakes likely to involve, then we need to administer the appropriate antivenom. And then you want to admit these patients for observation or transfer them out to somewhere where they can do ongoing management for these patients because they will need 12 to 24 hours admission to hospital. And some of them that develop that neurotoxicity will require mechanical ventilation. So our laboratory investigations that we're going to do, and this is quite often certainly in the WAC sites where you're going to be transferring these to the regional centres because you're not able to provide these. And you can't use point of care testing. So for your INRs and your D dimers, I know some of you out there have point of care testing. These give false negatives and they actually need to be done in a proper Pathwest laboratory. And the bloods that you want to do on these patients is you want to do a full blood pressure, then your coag profile. So we're looking for APTT, INR, D dimer. Then you're going to look for your muscle breakdown with your creatinine kinase, urea and electrolyte abnormalities, and then a lactate as well. There are some sites that will still have snake venom detection kit. These aren't as specific, can, can sometimes cloud things. And generally, if you've got your laboratory data and your clinical picture and know your geography, the snake venom detection kit doesn't actually offer you a lot of value. And this is where you do a bite side swab um, over where they've been bitten. And then in your lab, they'll run it through this snake venom detection kit. But it's certainly not used as much as it used to, and it certainly can cloud the picture in that. So we tend to move away from it these days. You can also use a urine sample um, if you can't get the bite side swab. So your first aid and your initial treatment for these patients is always going to be to apply a pressure bandage and mobilisation. But we also want to keep these patients calm and still so that we can actually keep the venom actually in the lymphatic system and avoid getting it shifted through into the circulatory system. OK, and the whole purpose and tenet of the pressure mobilisation bandage is actually to retard the ven venom in the lymphatic system and not actually move it into the circulatory system. And that's where the compression comes into it. Pressure mobilization bandages can stay on for hours. And remember, we're putting these on like we would for a sprained ankle. OK, so it's more for support and compression of the tissues, but it's not to impair the circulation in any way. So they still should have good distal pulses and should still have a distal capillary refill time less than three to the affected limb. If you haven't got that, then you've put it on too tight and you need to leave it off, loosen it off because you will cause compartment syndrome and stuff that can develop. Remembering we're using an elastic crepe bandage. There is no indication for a gauze bandage in these patients. Okay, gauze won't give enough tensile strength to actually support um, the lymphatic system. So you need to use those elastic bandages. So you should have them stocked and available in your triage area. If you don't, you need to get them. If they've been bitten somewhere where you can't actually apply a bandage to it, so they've been bitten on the abdomen or the chest or something, we need to try and apply local pressure and immobilise the patient. So that may just be direct digital type pressure with a hand or palm of a hand over the site until you can actually get them in, get some bloods off and get them assessed thoroughly and stuff. But you also want to immobilise the patient, okay? 
The thing with putting a pressure mandalize mobilization bandages is that you're going to start over the bite site and go around there and then go up the limb and then you're going to come back and go distally and go all the way up the limb there. So you start over the bite site and progressively move your way up and then you'll come back from the distal end. So if it's on the limb there, you'll start at the toes and work your way back up. You then need to immobilize the limb. So you want to, instead of just putting on the pressure mobilization bandage, you also want to splint that limb and keep it, so stop it from moving and then immobilize the patient as well to stop them moving. And that's with the hope that you can keep the venom in the actual lymphatic system and not get it into the circulatory system. When are we going to remove the pressure bandage? Pressure bandage? When they've been in a hospital that's equipped and able to manage these patients, so you have a doctor available, you have support available, you have antivenom, you've got IV access. We can take it off when they've got normal laboratory investigations and a normal physical exam, or if we've started treatment, so we've given them the antivenom. So we can give them the antivenom, then we can remove the pressure bandage and that, but you shouldn't um, take it off until all these things have been ticked. So you've got normal bloods, normal physical exam, spoken to the toxicologist and they're all happy, take it off. Or you actually know they're envenomed and you've started the antivenom. And generally the antivenom only goes in after half an hour. So I generally would recommend that given the antivenom, then take it off. We do know, and there are case reports of deterioration in patients after the pressure bandage has been removed. That's one of the reasons why we know it works. So if your patient does start circling the drain after you've taken off the pressure bandage, you want to reapply the pressure mobilization bandage. Uh, you want to repeat your laboratory studies, and then you're generally going to be giving them an antivenom pretty quickly. So if you take it off and they deteriorate in any way, put it straight back on, repeat your bloods, and give them an antivenom. So excluding someone that's been envenomed. So generally, if they come in and you got no, your first set of blood show that there's no clinical or laboratory features to show that there's envenomation, you take your pressure bandage off. But then we also need to observe these patients for 12 hours. And we're going to do bloods at six and 12 hours post them being bitten. OK, so it's not the post getting the pressure bandage off. We're going to do these six and 12 hour bloods post the time that they're actually bitten. OK, remember, we don't want to discharge these patients at night in case we miss any of the neurotoxicity type features that can develop suddenly over a period of time. But generally, these patients, once they're with you, they're there for at least 12 hours and you're going to do these bloods at six and 12 hours post the bite to make sure that we haven't missed anything. When are you going to give these patients antivenom? Okay, so it's when there's abnormal physical laboratory findings that are consistent with envenomation. So your absolute indications for giving someone antivenom is when they report a sudden collapse, seizure or cardiac arrest consistent with being bitten by a snake. If they've got an abnormal INR level. So we know your normal INR level 0 0.9 to 1.3. So anything above that would be an indication to treat with antivenom. If they've got any evidence of paralysis with ptosis or ophthalmoplegia being the earliest signs, then we're going to treat then early as well. Some of your relative indications, so your systemic symptoms, so if they've been bitten by a snake and they've got vomiting, headaches, abdominal pain, diarrhea, an elevated white cell count, abnormal activated partial APTT time, or they've got signs of renal impairment with a raised creatinine kinase level and myoglobinemia developing. So when we talk about antivenoms, there's two types. There's your monovalent and your polyvalent. So your monovalent is more specific, it's cheaper, and it causes less serum sickness. Um, and so there's a monovalent for all your categories of snakes. So your black, your brown, your tigers, your sea snakes, your death adders. Well, then if we can't work out what's bitten them, there is a polyvalent antivenom, and it contains one each of those monovalent antivenoms. Okay, but it's a higher risk of serum sickness and anaphylaxis with. So generally with a good with good laboratory investigations, geographical area, 
and clinical examination, you should be able to go for the molyvalent over the polyvalent. And this is where your clinical toxicologist will come in. So as I just said, you, knowing you're choosing a molyvalent can help. Um, and sometimes if they've actually been, people know what snake's actually bitten them. So a snake handler or a herpetologist has been bitten and they definitely know it's a dugot or a brown snake, then they will actually go for the monovalent over that. In some regions, if we, so we know like in the southwest of WA, there's a lot of brown and tiger snakes. And that's the predominantly group of snakes that are down there. So if someone presents with a snake bite and we're unable to work out which snake it may be occurred to them, then we can just go ahead and give them a vial of the brown and the tiger at the same time. And then that's instead of using the full polyvalent and giving them the other four doses of antivenom. And that should genuinely be suffice and they should get better from it. So just some antivenom pearls. So this is a serum. And as you can see there, the way that they make antivenom is they get a venom from a snake. And you'll see the videos, they milk it into the cup through the glad wrap. They then inject the venom into a horse's bloodstream. And so this is done in the CSL laboratory. And then they let the venom go through the horse's um, serum into the bloods. And then they take off some of the horse's red blood cells that's got the venom in it. And that then gets spun through a centrifuge machine that pulls off the rich plasma. And then they do this separation type picture where they separate the antibodies from it. And then they get those antibodies, which makes the antivenom, and they um, process them, sterilize them, mix and attenuate them into a vial. And this is where the antivenoms actually come from. So that's how they actually make the antivenoms. And because it is a serum, anaphylaxis is common in these patients. And so it does occur in about 5% of these patients. So if the patient does get anaphylaxis, so hypertension, wheezing, urticaria rash, you're going to stop the infusion, treat the anaphylaxis with adrenaline. And once you've got on top of the anaphylactic symptoms, you want to get back on and get the actual antivenom into them because they need that as well. Antivenoms are safe in peds and pregnancy, and it's the exact same dose as an adult. Okay, so nice and simple, safe for all and that. Because it is a serum, um, that we are inducing into the body. There is a condition called serum sickness that can occur with giving antivenoms. And this is where patients can develop 24, 48 hours after getting an antivenom, a fever, rash, um, muscle aches and pains, feel a bit fluey and lethargic for it. And the treatment for that is generally, we'll put them on a course of prednisolone, 50 milligrams for five days to try and um, overcome some of those things. One of the biggest pearls and pitfalls we see with the administration of antivenom is that you actually need to give it time to work. And certainly when we're dealing with the coagulation side of things, um, it takes about 10 to 20 hours for coagulation to start to improve. So you can do repeat bloods on it, but it's not, a, and the bloods may get worse, but this isn't an indication to keep giving more antivenom. We know from the AS study that these patients um, genuinely only require one vial of antivenom. Going back 20 years, we used to give brown snake envenomation up to 10 vials of antivenom. Now we just give one and we think that's sufficient. But the ones that are developing these coagulopathies, you need to give them time to actually let it resolve. So with your patients that have quite severe venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy, the VIC, it's going to take 24 to 36 hours. And the resolution is going to be about the body interacting with the antivenom and start synthesizing new clotting factors and that. So just because the bloods may start to look worse doesn't mean you need to keep going ahead and giving more antivenom. You need to actually give it time for it to work. Another thing to, that we shouldn't forget with these patients is that they're high risk for tetanus as well. So anyone that's been bitten by a snake, make sure that their tetanus is up to date. It's a good thing that there's some toxicologists because we don't see a lot of snake bites. And so it's hard to keep up to date with all the symptoms and what we should be doing. And so you should have in your sites the wax snake bite observation chart, which is quite a simple way of documenting and measuring 
um, how the patients are doing and looking for those complications from your neurotoxicity to your coagulopathy to your general types of stemic symptoms and doing your limb evaluations for those that have pressure mobilization. So certainly have these charts. It's a really good cognitive aid rather than actually using it as a chart to make sure you're not missing anything um, and it does help. And yeah, it's just a simple way of recording these symptoms. And certainly if your patient's stable, I'd most of be doing this every hour for at least the first four hours and then every two hours after that while you're managing these patients. So before we move into some case studies, this is just from the therapeutic guidelines. Um, and I'll send Anna an article that she can send out with everyone. So this is just a simple flow chart for dealing with anyone that presents with a history of snake bites. So if they present to you, you want to make sure that you get a pressure bandage on as soon as possible. And we want to transfer them to a centre where that can manage those things. Resuscitate early and give antivenoms immediately if they're in any form of critical deterioration. Um, and if you're going to take the pressure bandage off, make sure the antivenom's given first. You then want to take your bloods and you're going to repeat your bloods at 6 and 12 hours afterwards. Um, and if they've got any signs of non-envenomation, then you're going to actually do your bloods and then take your pressure bandage off. And then you're just going to keep them in an observation type area and do bloods at 6 and 12 hours following that. And other big point is never discharge these patients at night. Always keep them to daylight hours where you're keeping an eye on them in a hospital setting overnight. All right, moving on. So this is case number one, and I'm going to play a bit of a video. You can see a video here. So that's a 23-year-old Instagram influencer that we all see around the place. She sees the snakes and just gets a bit close to it. And the snake decides to bite her on the ankle. As you can see down there, those little scratch marks is a bite from a juvenile type snake. She presents to the emergency department where she's feeling dizzy, nausea and vomiting. She develops epistaxis and hematuria. And her blood's come back with an INR of six. She's got undetectable fibrinogen. She's got a D-dimer of 320. And this is consistent with brown snake envenomation. And you can see from that video, it was a small brown snake that bit her. So there's eight types of brown snakes. And the common that we see throughout Western Australia is the Jugite or the Eastern and Western brown snake. A lot of the time, these patients will present asymptomatic after severe envenomation, um, after being bitten. But there are cases of severe envenomation that results in this venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy. And certainly in Western Australia, we've had a few of these patients die from interstrebal hemorrhages from being bitten by a brown snake that's resulted in that VIC developing. So distribution of brown snakes, they're all around Australia. Um, they present generally on mainland, but they can be found around water and um, estuaries and rivers as well, but they're generally inhabitants of um, land. And the brown snake envenomation, so the things that we'll see is they, the ones that have got quite severe envenomation, they will get the VIC. So you notice bleeding gums. So you can see there in that picture around the teeth, notice that they've got bleeding around their teeth, when you put a cannula in, they'll bleed quite heavily at the site and it can be quite difficult to manage. And as I said, a few have succumbed to quite severe interstrebal hemorrhages. Renal failure and decreased renal output are infrequent. Very rare do they develop any form of neurotoxicity of diplopia or ptosis. The ones that do die or go into cardiac arrest from brown snake envenomation is where they get the release straight into the circulatory system. And this has a direct cardiac toxicity effect. And so this is where they can present with syncope, collapse, and result in cardiac arrest and arrhythmias. Just looking a little bit more at the venom induced consumptive coagulopathy that you'll see with brown snake envenomation. So you can get a complete VIC. And so this is where they have an elevated INR. 
that's above three, undetectable fibrinogen, so it'll just come back undetectable on your bloods, um, an elevated D-dimer, so 10 times the normal. If you've got a partial VIC, this is when your INR is abnormal, but it's less than three, and they'll have a low, but they've still got some detectable fibrinogen. So remember, fibrinogen is part of that clotting cascade that we need to actually clot. And recovering from the VIC and the INR returning to less than two, as I said, with the antivenoms, it takes about 10 to 20 hours after the bite to occur. So your brown snake management, so you're going to get these patients into your resus bay. You may need to be prepared for uncontrolled hemorrhage and stuff. So our antivenom is going to be giving them one vial of brown snake antivenom. Okay, and hopefully that can help manage that uncontrolled hemorrhage. If it doesn't, there is a study looking at giving them fresh frozen plasma. I know that's very hard for country sites to get access to um, in certain conditions, but they are looking at that as a treatment. Hypertension can ensure in these patients. So you're going to fluid resuscitate them and may look to inotropes or vasopressors once you've got them adequately fluid resuscitated. They get that thromboemicroangiographic bloods and renal failure developing. They may need transfer to an ICU and dialysis. Your main treatment is going to be getting that one vial of CSL brown snake antivenom in. It needs to go in IV. There's no indication for giving this IM, so you need to get vascular access in these patients. So you draw it up, you mix it up into 500 mils of normal saline, and you run it in over 20 minutes. If the patient goes into cardiac arrest or presents in cardiac arrest, you're just going to give them a push dose of the 1,000 units of antivenom, okay? You're not going to run it as a fusion. You just give it in like you'd give your adrenaline. Moving on to case number two. So this is Barry. He's a 64-year-old male. He's been bitten and he's sitting there reading the paper. And you can see here the snake's coming up behind him and he gets bitten to the calf. I'll just let you watch the video. You can see there, poor Barry's drinking his coffee, reading the paper. But poor Barry, just enjoying the paper and a coffee and the snake gets him out of nowhere. So he calls an ambulance. He gets brought into you. He's quite drowsy. Weakness, reports generalised weakness. He's bleeding from his IV site and from his gums. So Barry's been bitten by a tiger snake. And so we see these around southern Australia moving up into the Queensland coast. Um, they generally coexist in brown snake areas. And they do have similar clinical features to brown, but the clinical features that the brown don't have is that these result in paralysis. They're very fast moving and they're an easily alarmed snake. And as you can see there, so certainly we see them in the southwest of WA, so they're very prominent, pertinent around Esperance, Albany, Denmark, Bunbury, Bustleton type areas, and even into the Perth metro area. Um, we see them around uh, lakes around Perth as well. And then you see them more over in Victoria, heading up through New South Wales into the Queensland coast and stuff. Um, Garden and Karnak Islands off West Australia has a huge inhabitants of them, but we don't actually see them on Rottnest Island. So tiger snake envenomation is characterised by this pre and post synaptic neurotoxins that can result in this flaccid paralysis. So your early signs that these patients may be developing paralysis and going into respiratory failure. So looking for the diplopia, ptosis and respiratory failure. They will result, they do have procoagulant features as well. So VIC can develop and they can also develop myotoxins. So rhabdomyolysis and significant pain over the bite site. So your potential life threats with VIC um, and uncontrolled hemorrhage, paralysis and respiratory failure, 
and hypertension. So these with tiger snakes, we need to be prepared that respiratory failure may occur and we need, may need to take over and intubate these patients earlier and put them on mechanical ventilation. Your treatment for tiger snake antivenom, it's one vial of CSL tiger snake antivenom, which is 3,000 units. Same consistency and administration for all of antivenoms. So it's 500 mils in normal saline over 20 minutes. In cardiac arrest, you're going to give it as a push dose. If they've got severe and uncontrolled VIC developing, then you may want to discuss with the clinical toxicologists about getting them some FFP on top of them as well. So that's tiger snake. We're going to move on now to case number three. So this is 13-year-old Susan. She's camping out near Mount Magnet. At night, she gets up to go for a wee and she accidentally steps on a snake and it bites her on the ankle. You can see the snake here. So she drives to the nursing post, which is about an hour away, and she's reporting double vision and difficulty swallowing. So this is the death adder. And so death adders we find out in mainland Australia. Okay, so they like the dry areas. You don't see them too much on the coast. Bites and venoming are uncommon in death adders, okay, but they do strike out. Um, and the thing with death adders is they're very short, viper-like appearance. So they generally don't go above about one metre in length. Um, and they have this diamond-shaped head with this big fat type body. And they tend to be quite nocturnal, so they mainly come out at night as well. And that's where we see most people walking back to messes on campsites, walking on mine sites and stuff like that. It's where we see these. And so we mainly see them up into the middle of West Australia, places around Newman, Marble Bar, into the mining type areas as well as where they'd like to inhabit more than going near the water. Um, and as you can see there on the map, they're found all throughout Australia on the drier type areas. So death adder and venomation. So this is mainly caused of neurotoxins. So it targets the um, pre and post synaptic neurotoxins. They often report pain and stinging at the bite sites, but for some reason puncture marks may not be apparent in death adder. So you may not actually see a bite site mark, but you may actually feel pain and stuff over it. This picture here is ptosis. So we can see here we're asking this gentleman to open up his eyes as much as possible. And he's trying, but he's got drooping of the eyelid. So this is what ptosis looks like. Your signs that you've got systemic envenomation is that they get this descending flaccid paralysis that develops within six hours. Your early signs is your diplopia and your difficult swallowing. And if they develop severe envenomation, this is when paralysis, respiratory failure and hypoxic cardiac arrest can develop and ensure. So your management, you want to prepare for life threats. So you may need to put these patients on intubation and mechanical ventilation to time through it. There is a CSL death adder antivenom available. So it's one vial of 6,000 units given exactly the same way. So over 20 minutes in 500 mils of normal saline. Sometimes if they've got severe envenomation, it's not going to be enough and you will have to put them into an induced coma and manage them and transfer them down to an intensive care unit um, where they will get better over 24 to 48 hours. Cool. All right, last case. So this is a 28-year-old Brody that's paddleboarding. So as you can see, some people who get bitten by snakes aren't the most intellectual types, um, and it does result in snake bites, but they keep us employed and they pay our mortgages. So we should always look for the positive in stuff. So he gets bitten by a sea snake onto his leg. So when we're talking about sea snakes is that there's over 30 species. Generally with sea snakes is that they're inquisitive and not aggressive. Um, and bites generally occur when they're handled or they're tried to be touched. And we see fishermen when they get them caught in their nets and they try to remove them and stuff. That's quite often when these people get bitten. We need to be wary around the coastal areas because things like tiger snakes and brown snakes and taipans will hang around coastal areas as well. 
So we, although sea snakes have a specific clinical characteristics, the snake may actually be a brown snake or a tiger snake and that. So we can't always anchor on just because they're in the water that it was actually a sea snake. So sea snakes are found all throughout Australia in coastal regions, um, out in the ocean and stuff. Don't see them too much in rivers and estuaries. They're more likely to be terrestrial snakes like your tiger or brown. So you see snake envenomation, you get systemic symptoms of headache, nausea and vomiting, and then your type of systemic neurotoxicity that will develop is similar to the death adder where they'll get descending flaccid paralysis with an onset within six hours. And you're looking for your signs and symptoms of ptosis, blurred vision, difficulty swallowing. Myotoxicity can occur in some sea snakes that leads to renal failure and where they'll need dialysis, but that's rare. So sea snake management, you want to prepare for rapid onset paralysis and hypertension. So you may need to fluid resuscitate these patients and potentially look to intubation and airway support. Antivenom, you're going to give it at the first signs of paralysis or myotoxicity developing. There is a sea snake antivenom available, um, which is a thousand units. Um, if you don't have this available because it's hard to get and we don't have it in a lot of sites, you can substitute with tiger snake antivenom, but it's best to have that discussion with your toxicologist at your poisons information centre first. So that's all I've got for you. I just might skip over the questions part and just finish with the take home points and then I'll answer all your questions. So I think the take home points is I want you to have an approach, know the signs and symptoms and the clinical characteristics of how to recognize these patients that present with a snake bite. Keep your pressure and mobilization bandages at triage and make sure it's your elastic and not your gauze types. It's hard to get experts and people that are really comfortable in managing snake bites. So use the experts that are available to you at the end of the phone. So ring the poison center. When it comes to antivenoms, one vial is generally enough. Um, you just need to give it time to work and make sure you don't discharge these people at night. So I'll stop sharing my slides and I'll take any of your questions. Uh, Larissa? Thanks, Kane. That was fantastic. I don't think I'll ever be able to sit on a balcony and enjoy reading peacefully ever again. Thanks, Barry. Um, yeah. But I just had a question. I was wondering, is there any advantage to using Rotem to assess and monitor for coagulation disorders? It's not something that's been studied or that I looked at, and basically your coag profile should be enough. And there's talk whether the actual FFP and that makes a huge amount of difference in that and it's generally time and antibodies from that and the antivenoms working yeah i can have a chat with the tox guys and get back but yeah it's it's a bit conflicting at the moment to be honest yeah yep. and you ask half of them they say oh they'd give ffp and half wouldn't so yeah interesting yeah. all right cool thank you no it was fantastic thanks it was a great um great session kane thank you no worries uh claire Hello, um, we are at a remote nursing post in Shark Bay. Yep. What would our kind of initial management of a snake bite be? We have quite a lot of sea snakes here as well. Yep. Um, and obviously just point of care testing and like very limited resources. Yep. Um, I guess, would it just be assessing what kind of snake could be and then administering an antivenom with ETS yep. support, I guess? Yep. yep, and if they're critically unwell with signs and would go by the geography, and we'll go by the signs and symptoms. The point of care blood testings aren't reliable, so we can't yes. use it. If they're stable, it'll just be immobilizing the patient, pressure immobilization bandage, and would be flying them to Geraldton or Headland, Caratha, where they can get laboratory bloods done and go from there. But if there was deterioration, then they may look to say, uh, go brown or tiger, give both, or give the polyvalent. Mm -hmm. And we have had RFDS, we had one in Coral Bay, where yes. we got RFDS to actually fly in the antivenom and they gave it on the plane, or they gave it in ED and flew them out. So yeah, it's tricky. Mm. 
And if they were in our centre for longer yeah. than six hours, would we take bloods and spin them so that they can be sent with the patient or we just wouldn't worry you about could. it? You could. Yeah, they'll do a fresh set as well when you get to Geraldton, but there's no harm in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and RFDS generally prioritise these as P1s to get them out. So they do go above and beyond within the realms to try and get them out of there as soon as possible. Sure. But yeah, it's a very tricky position when you're in places like that. Oh, that's uh, Leonie? I'm asking the hard question. What happens to the horse? I think they're okay, to be honest. If you read the CSL handbook on antivenoms and stuff, it's all above board and life-saving. So I think they have strict ethics around it and stuff, and the horses do. I don't think they die after it occurs. I know, it's, it's an interesting one. I just did yeah. wonder that, apart from being a horse lover. No, yeah. I just, it did just make me wonder. I thought, gosh, you know, is there something particular about the horse's blood type or any particular mm. reason why they've chosen that because it's a big beast I don't know but it was just something yeah. that interested me yeah Thanks. good question thank you <laughs> any more questions we'll make the slides available to Anna and there's an article that's free access online that was published in 2013 by a toxicology working group looking at snake bites. I'll send that through to Anna. And they've recently updated the toxicology handbook, which you should be able to get through the WA Health Library as well, that has more information on this stuff. Thank you so much, Kane. That was very thorough, very informative. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. No worries. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe out there. Just a reminder to everyone, if you can pop on the chat, which site you're, you're um, dialing in from. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks. See ya.